Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started, which is super exciting. Um, everyone, please feel free to grab coffee and enjoy breakfast. I've got just some intro remarks, but in advance, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. We couldn't be more excited to have you. On behalf of the Penlock community and the Toll Public Interest Center, welcome to the 34th annual Edward V. Spare Symposium, Law 2.0, Progress and Challenges for Justice in the Digital Age. My name is Nicole Schneidman, and as one of this year's student organizers, I again want to just thank you for joining us for what we really hope will be a very exciting exploration of the intersection of technology, law, and social justice. If you haven't gotten a sense of this from the program, I promise you're in for a real treat today. So before we get started, I just want to take a moment to thank a few of the many people who have made today's event possible. First, to the 24 panelists who have journeyed from across the country to be with us today. Thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise. To the Penn Law faculty, and particularly the dedicated team of the Toll Public Interest Center, thank you for your guidance and always serving as a source of inspiration. And finally, thank you to my fellow students, and particularly the Penn Toll Scholars. Thank you for your ideas, your enthusiasm, and willingness to spend your Friday with us just a month ago before finals. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So it's my honor to introduce Penn Law's Dean Wendell Pritchett. As a scholar of urban history and policy, longtime member of the Penn community, and leader in both the nonprofit and public sector, Dean Pritchett epitomizes commitment to public interest. Without taking too much time, I just wanted to provide a few highlights of his many achievements. Chair of the Urban Policy Task Force for then Senator Barack Obama's presidential campaign. Chair of Community Legal Services of Philadelphia. Deputy Chief of Staff and Director of Policy for Philadelphia's Mayor Nutter. And President of the Philadelphia Housing Development Corporation. Again, these examples barely scratch the surface, but without further, further ado, here's Dean Pritchett. Thank you. Good morning. We're going to have an interactive day so we can start over. Good morning. Yeah, that was really not very good. Good morning. There we go. That's a really good. Nicole, thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, I really do want to welcome you all to uh, Penn Law School and to the 34th Annual uh, Spare Symposium. Isn't that a wonderful thing, the 34th Annual Spare Symposium? Uh, I think I'm looking around the room and I see several people from my generation. Um, and so I think uh, many of the people in this room uh, know something about Ed Spare. Um, but I think it's important uh, to stop for a second and I will be brief to talk to you a little bit about Ed Sparrow and why this event is, is so important. Um, so this, this symposium, uh, symposium honors the work and vision of the late Edward V. Sparrow, who was a professor of law and social policy here at Penn Law for many years. Uh, he had an ongoing commitment to the vital relationship between the study of law and the practice of it in order to help those in poverty the study of law and the practice of it, and then the last part is the most important part, in order to help those in poverty. Sparrow was a champion of the rights of the poor. His critical work led to the Supreme Court striking down residency requirements for recipients of welfare uh, and established their right to a hearing before their aid was terminated. These were extremely important uh, accomplishments among many that Ed had. In an interview, Sparrow said, this is a quote, it seems to me only reasonable that we should guarantee the subsidy of life the subsidy of life to those who are starving and to those without shelter or medicine. Reasonable not only on humanitarian grounds, but because there is a 14th Amendment. This is how Ed taught. There is a 14th Amendment, which guarantees equal protection of the laws. For him, the law is a mechanism for creating equality. But as all of you know, uh, the problem of poverty has not gone away, and the work of ensuring justice continues. I am happy to say that at Penn Law, I think that we understand this important work. Uh, as you know, we, have, we were one of the first law schools in the country to have a pro bono requirement. Uh, students must have 70 hours of pro bono work in order to graduate, and most of our students do much more than that. Uh, in the last 25 years of this program, our students have contributed 500,000 hours to our communities uh, in public service, and I know that we can do more, and I know that all of us are willing and ready to do more, as are all of you. Um, we face new challenges in the 21st century, uh, challenges that remind us how critical it is uh, to understand the relationship between, and the, uh, between the study and the practice of law. 
uh, as we're going to be talking about today. New technologies like social media are helping people fight injustice around the globe, but they're also making us reconsider what privacy means and how we should protect it. These are important questions. The internet may allow greater access to information uh, than ever before, but does that matter when some people don't have access to the internet? Should everyone have access to the internet in this room? I think we know the answer to that question, but that doesn't mean that challenge is anywhere near solved yet. These are important questions, and that's why so many thoughtful scholars and experts are here today. Uh, we really do welcome you, and I want to sit down so that we can actually listen to them uh, and talk about these really important issues. Before I do, I do want to thank all the panelists for coming. Um, I want to, uh, want to congratulate our fellows, our public interest fellows, particularly the organizers of this event. You've done a terrific job bringing together an excellent group and putting together a great program, and I know it's going to be a terrific day. Um, and so I really want to welcome all of you and hope that you have a terrific day, and I now want to up Siri Carlson, a second year Toll Scholar, uh, who's going to introduce the first panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Pritchett, for those uh, wonderful words. Um, I'd like to invite my panelists to come up and join me for our first panel, where we're going to be talking about online activism and the role of online organizing in social and political movements. And as my panelists make their way up, I just want to give them an idea of who's in the audience. And so a show of hands, please, if you have been on Facebook or Twitter in the past 48 hours. Anyone? A few of us, OK. Um, and for those um, of us who have maybe gotten our news online, our news updates online in the past week. Anyone? OK, a few of us, most of us. Um, in terms of the last, uh, the last election, did anybody research their political candidates online? Anyone do any research online? Um, and finally, um, have, any, have any of you ever looked up an organization or a person who's doing work um, in the area that you're interested in uh, online as a primary resource? Wonderful. Um, as you can see from those shows of hands, online information, social media, and networking are ubiquitous in our culture today. Um, and today we're going to explore whether they really work to connect people uh, who are passionate about political and social justice, or if their impact in, in social and political movements uh, are in physical reality may be less than straightforward. And here to help us examine that today are uh, our wonderful esteemed panelists. Um, and I'll start um, at the far end with uh, Dr. Gubin Yang, who is an associate professor of communication and sociology. Um, and the Annenberg School for Communication in the Department of Sociology here at Penn. His extensive expertise in sociology, social movements, and, um, and online activism will help us understand today the role of online organizing in both the domestic and international contexts, as well as the dangers regarding government observation of online activists. And um, I'm giving very short bios, so please feel free to uh, look in your um, in your symposium brochures for more about the great work that these panelists are doing. Um, next to Dr. Yang is Noah Weiner, a senior partner at Dragonfly Partners, a Philly-based organization that works to support organizations that are stuck in strategic, organizational, or interpersonal concerns. Before co-founding uh, Dragonfly Partners, he was a founding campaign strategist at moveon.org for seven years. Mr. Weiner will help us explore the unique contributions and challenges that online organizing makes to activism. In the center, we have Amy Laura Kahn. She's a grad of Penn Law and, and of the Toll Public Interest Scholar Program. And today, she directs the Garden Justice Legal Initiative uh, at the Public Interest Law Center of Philadelphia. Today, she'll be telling us about the initiative, and specifically in the context of a website that was launched in 2013, groundedinphilly.org, which uses online data and community organizing to democratize information about vacant and abandoned lots and promote civic engagement in Philadelphia. Uh, next, we have Mr. Vincent Harris. He runs Harris Media, which is a digital marketing and advertising agency in Austin, Texas. Most recently, Mr. Harris ran digital operations in Senator Mitch McConnell's successful reelection campaign. Mr. Harris today will be sharing with us his experience and expertise in digital media, online organizing, and political campaigns. 
And next to me here, I have Ms. Jennifer Ellis, uh, who is an ethics and legal, legal malpractice attorney with Lowenthal and Abrams, and separately, she works as a marketing consultant for law firms. Uh, as an expert in ethics and social media, she will be speaking to the ethical and legal implications of online organizing for lawyers and their clients. Uh, we'll be getting a lot of great information from our panelists today, and I encourage any and all of you to, as we go through the panel, grab the note cards that are at the center of your table and write down any questions that you might have for our panelists. At the end, we'll be taking some time to do a question and answer. And so at any time during the panel, please feel free to hold up your questions, and Jacob and Adika will come around and grab those and bring them up to me. Finally, I hope you're all noticing the hashtag Spayer34. Please feel free to pull out your phones and tweet about our conference today at any time. We highly encourage that. Without further ado, I'd like to launch into our discussion of online activism. And to start us off, I'd like to, Dr. Gang to provide us a framework and a definition of what a social movement is and what it needs to be successful. Uh, good morning. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for having me on this, on this panel. Um, the topic is really important and, and very timely, um, but the uh, task that I got is not an easy one. <laughs> I can think of about 100 definitions of social movements, and um, I'll go over 20 of them. Uh, no, actually, no. Um, what I wanted to say is that uh, even among the um, scholars who, whose career is in the study of social movements and collective action and activism, there's no accepted standard definition of social movements um, for a variety of reasons. Because uh, first of all, things change. You know, times may be different. A movement that is considered as a movement in the past may be, you know, may be different today. Uh, today, for instance, our topic about online activism, technology, uh, really raises a lot of new issues about how to understand activism and social movements. So that's one thing I would like to just put on the table for our discussion, that there is no standard definition of social movements. <laughs> Having said that, I think there are a couple of things, maybe two things that uh, generally people can agree on when we talk about social movements. One is that it involves some kind of collective efforts. But the collective itself is very ambiguous. Do we consider five people as a collective, or 500, or 50? There's a very influential social movement scholar um, some years ago counted, in, in his study, he counted the number of protest act activities, social movements, and he used 50 people. If, if a collective action involves 50 people, then we can say, we can say this is a social movement. But again, that is not agreed upon. But some kind of collective efforts is important. This is one, one thing that I think uh, is agreed upon. The other thing is that the efforts are aimed to produce for, to struggle for, certain kind of social change, but also to resist social change. In that, in that sense, both progressive and sometimes reactionary um, kind of activities, collective efforts, may, be, may fall into the category of social movements. And sometimes efforts are, have very clear goals, other times not less clear. It's general, general you know, raising public consciousness, for instance, instead of raising wages for you know, union uh, members. So that also uh, sort of complicates the understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yang, for that definition. Um, and we really appreciate uh, the fact that there may be many different goals. And some of our panelists will be able to speak to that as we go through uh, the, the panel today. Uh, Mr. Weiner, I would like to address the next question to you in terms of the impact that online organizing has had in activism. 
Uh, how has online organizing changed the face of activism? And what is activism in the digital age? Thank you, and I also wanna thank you all for being here and thank the organizers for inviting me to be here. Uh, I would say that online organizing has, has the, the change that it has made is that it, it has allowed more and more of us to find each other, to find people with shared goals, and to invite them to join us in action. And that action can be both online and offline. So I'll tell, I'll tell you a story um, from, the, from the, some of the early days at, at moveon.org. Um, this is post 9-11, after the trauma of, of that tragedy. And, and President Bush was rallying the country to, to go to war with Iraq. And there were many of us who were opposed to that war, but we were labeled unpatriotic and the mainstream media wouldn't let us speak. So people were actually afraid to speak in that time. You may remember what that, what that political moment felt like. People were, were afraid to speak up if they were alone. So at Move On, we used online petitions to, to gather people together, to gather millions of people who were opposed to the war all in one place. And those people hosted house parties, and they met neighbors who they had never met before who were opposed to the war. And together, we found the courage to speak out both by collecting small donations to run news, newspaper ads opposing the war, by holding vigils in the street, by meeting members of Congress. So you can see in that story, online organizing was a key catalyst, but it doesn't replace traditional offline organizing. So I really would say the, the same rules apply as in the days of the abolitionist Frederick Douglass, who famously said, this is one of my kind of anchoring um, concepts, power concedes nothing without a demand. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Injustice and wrong will continue till they are resisted with either words or blows or both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. So the question is, if power concedes nothing without a demand, how much power can you mobilize to make change? Power usually means organized money or organized people, and online organizing gives more of us access to the tools to organize enough people power, sometimes money power, to make change. But I want to be clear that online organizing is not magic, just because it has to do with technology. You still have to think strategically about how to deploy that power that you've mobilized. Who's your target? What are your interests? What would, move them to make the what would move the decision makers to make the decision that you want? Those are the questions that organizers ask themselves, and those questions apply to online organizing just as much. And lastly, it's important to note that the opportunity to use these digital tools only exists if you have access to them and the education to use them. So this access is, um, as, you, as you probably know, severely limited. Um, by ongoing structural racism, by growing wealth inequality, and by the increasing corporate control of the internet, which I'll speak to more later th today. Thank you, Mr. Weiner. In terms of the mobilization of power, I think we've all seen a few really strong examples of that in the different social media platforms that are being used, whether it's a hashtag on Twitter or an awareness building campaign uh, like the Ice Bucket Challenge. And uh, Ms. Ellis, I'm wondering if you could speak to um, the definition of something uh, along the lines of what is social media um, and how has that in and of itself been revolutionary in increasing mobilization or at least access to information? I can, and thank you uh, to everyone and especially to my timekeeper back there. Since I'm a lawyer, I like to speak, so I like you. But thank you for having me here today. It's a great honor. The funny thing about my speaking is most of the time when I'm invited to speak, it's, it's to tell people how to sell themselves and how not to get in trouble doing it. Um, and what I always tell them when, it first, when I'm first explaining what social media means, because as many of you know, we lawyers are notoriously slow to pick up on technology, I say that it's a generation ago now that I graduated law school, it's 16 years, and Social media didn't exist really. Friendster was just sort of starting to come about over the next few years after I graduated, which was really the sort of first major social media platform. The difference between the web as it was 
in the uh, late 90s and the web as it is now is the uh, interconnectedness and the ability to engage in two-way communication that social media and other sites that may not technically be social media bring. Is Reddit social media? I don't know. Certainly Facebook is social media, Twitter is social media, LinkedIn is social media, and these are all phrased that way because they give us the ability to create, they give us the ability to create um, two-way communications and to share things and to express opinions which can be good and it can be bad uh, because the amount of information we're sharing, as we'll get into later, can be problematic in some ways due to the falsity of that information. But in the end, and I probably won't use all my time because the definition is relatively simple, social media is two-way communication that enables you to say something and for other people to respond. That's really all it is. And the platforms and the technology and how well it works, those are all relative. But it's just two-way communication. It might as well be a walkie-talkie with a lot of people listening in. I'm excited for that walkie-talkie. Um, I'm hoping that we can maybe explore some concrete examples um, of different ways that people have utilized the tool of the internet for online organizing. And Ms. Khan, I'm wondering if you would tell us um, how online organizing has become an important tool for especially public interest lawyers. Um, and maybe tell us whether or not you think it's an essential tool. I'm not sure if I know the answer. I, I think it's, it has become integrated. So I think that's my answer to the last question. Thanks so much for having me. It's really amazing to be back here for Spare and see a lot of familiar faces and this familiar room. Um, I have a number of examples just from the Law Center's work. Um, starting with um, the Garden Justice Legal Initiative and grounded in philly.org. Um, so to tell that story, I have to say, there are hundreds of gardens in, and farms in Philadelphia. Um, the majority of them are land insecure. They are in um, primarily communities of color, low-income communities, immigrant and refugee communities, because that is where our vacant land is, but that's also where our farming tradition comes from. Um, so as I said, they are land insecure. And so a lot of my job in creating the Garden Justice Legal Initiative was to provide legal and policy support and community legal education around land access and land tenure. And so when I started, I went, to, uh, I went around the city to community groups. And I would do this thing where I would draw a city block full of vacancies. And then we would have a conversation of, and people would say, I would say, this is full of vacancies. And they would say, yeah, that's my block. And I'd say, okay, how do we figure out who owns those parcels? You know, you might be gardening on one, you might want to garden on one, you might want to actually just figure out how to um, make it not vacant anymore, get it developed, et cetera. Um, so let's figure out how, how, who owns that, and then let's figure out the pathways to legal access, because for years that's been a quagmire. Um, so I would do that, community group to community group, individuals, people would call me. I was holding all of this information about how to understand vacant land in Philadelphia and how to get legal access. And so we launched Grounded in Philly. And what Grounded does is that it actually aggregates existing open data to create probably the most comprehensive public data set about what, what is vacant in the city of Philadelphia. And then it provides tools for civic engagement. It tells you who owns them. It tells you some of the legal status. Um, it tells you, um, you know, who the city council member is, what the zoning is. Um, and then it provides you a platform to say, hey, I want to organize here. Here's my contact information, and people put that up. People put up questions. And so there's a really, real, not just an information piece, but also an engagement piece on a block level. But then we've used it for citywide organizing, so to get people out um, to testify for the land bank um, bill last fall, or to let them know that the, the law has changed about um, you know, zoning or high tunnels, building permits for high tunnels, things like that. Um, another example, um, two other examples really are, are in our school work. Um, last year, as many of you know, um, we were under the doomsday budget situation on the Philadelphia School District and parents were trying to figure out, well, how do we, there's so much going on in our schools that we're really, we're upset about, we're also frightened about, we want, we want an outlet. And so we worked with the Media Mobilizing Project, um, some city council offices, and Parents United for Public Education to create um, the Philly Complaints Project. So parents, guardians, teachers, students even, had a web-based portal 
to actually um, send complaints or allegations to the Pennsylvania Department of Education about what was happening physically in their schools. Um, so on the one hand, that, you know, they were able to do that, but on the other hand, what we were able to understand was that the Department of Education was actually not responding, even though they have a mandate to investigate um, curriculum deficiencies, allegations of curriculum deficiencies. So from that group of complaints, we were able to connect with people to find um, plaintiffs to actually bring litigation to um, and a mandamus action to call, uh, to ask the courts to order um, the Department of Education to actually investigate. So there, we found seven um, parent plaintiffs as well as a community organization and filed in September. But the stories of, of those seven parents are important, but so are the 800 plus other complaints that were filed. And under, using that tool to fully understand, well not fully, but at least have a, an understanding about what, what was going on in our schools is really important and we continue to do that. And finally, I, um, I'm just, I've just been watching over several years um, on Twitter that the hashtag Phil Ed, if you know that, it started out as hashtag Philly Education, but it's been shortened so you have more characters. And it's really convened a very interesting conversation that involves parents and involves students, advocates, student advocates, um, but also folks in government, um, folks in the media to really talk about what's happening in our schools. And when we filed litigation last week, um, the fair funding formula litigation, um, not me, but, but my colleagues, um, we were able to, to put that litigation in the context of the larger organizing effort. So I'll stop there and we'll keep going later. Thank you, Ms. Khan. Uh, another area where we've seen a lot of success um, in online organizing is in the political sphere. Um, and Mr. Harris, I'm hoping that you'll share some of your expertise in that area by telling us um, how the use of digital awareness and a digital campaign strategy uh, translates into future action in terms of campaign contributions or votes um, and how you see the, the online word, world transferring into the, uh, the real world. Yes, ma'am. Well, first off, thank you for the invitation. Y'all, I feel blessed to be in such a beautiful room. This is a gorgeous room on a gorgeous campus. I've never been here before. It's only my second time to Philadelphia, and it is a wonderful city. I took a picture at the love sign earlier today and sent it to my wife, and she it was a great thing for her to wake up to. So, um, well, there's a lot to discuss here. First off, there's a lot of misconceptions. One is that I think uh, something that used to be true, which is that Democrats are superior to Republicans in their use of technology and their use of the internet. For uh, Mr. Obama's campaign, President Obama's campaign certainly led the led the uh, way in terms of the use of technology and organizing and activism. But when you actually look at people across the country and when you look at voters, there was a there was a recent Pew study done that Republicans and Democrats are both equally as active online. Um, I can also tell you that when you when you look at my clients like Mitch McConnell and Ted Cruz and some other folks, the, the most active people on their social media pages are people 65 plus, are older people. It's your Tea Party grandma that's actually sharing and active on their social media accounts, largely. And how do you build those accounts? Well, one, we've come a long way in terms of being able to to, to build online presences where now you can take the Republican voter file, the Democratic voter file, and you can advertise to all of those people and bring them into your communities and bring them onto your pages knowing exactly who they are. People that have voted before, people that care about certain issues like in Kentucky, one of our biggest issues was coal. So we very actively recruited people into our online community who were from the coal regions and who cared about coal. A couple other things. Facebook just released some, some numbers. 43 million people this year engaged uh, very actively in politics on Facebook. Facebook, separately in a study, was the second place that people received news and information in politics after local news was Facebook. Every year that goes by, the internet becomes more and more a place that people go to consume news and 
media. There was a recent study done that people on average spend 3.9 hours a day watching television, 3.8 hours a day using some kind of device. And Google likes to talk about a three-screen approach, and this is how I see political activism and everything that I do for my campaigns. The average person goes home after work, they have Dancing with the Stars on the television, that's screen one. They have their laptop in their lap, that's screen two. And they have their cell phone in their hand and they're texting, that's screen three. And how do we reach people across all three screens when screen one is still driving the message? For, for my folks, it's Fox News. For others, it's CNN and MSNBC. At CNN and MSNBC. And whatever's being discussed on those channels drives a lot of the political discussion. So I can tell you the next week it's going to be immigration, right? It's going to be driven by all of these channels, and you're going to see people across social media driven by screen one active on screens two and screen three. A couple other things. We chose on the McConnell campaign to, to work with a technology called Nation Builder, something you should definitely look into that. It's a bipartisan technology firm based out of uh, Los Angeles. And when we were putting together what our database system would, would be, we didn't want the best Republican option. We wanted the best option. So we used Nation Builder. And I'm very pleased with what we got out of Nation Builder. Um, and so Nation Builder was founded by Joe Green, who was roommates with Mark Zuckerberg, who you might know. Uh, some of the great things about Nation Builder that are a little scary, to be honest, but uh, if you were in our database and you liked one of our statuses about the Second Amendment, let's say, we can pull in that information to the database and tag you as a Second Amendment voter. That's pretty cool, right? We can get your Twitter handles if you interact with anything on Mitch McConnell's website. We can get your Twitter handle and then run an ad to you and re-upload your Twitter handle. Right now in this room, without you even giving me anything more than your name, I can go and append and get your email address, right? That's how this, this, you know, this, this big data situation is working right now in politics. And I would say, um, last thing is donations. Obviously, online donations, look, one in 75 people in this country donated to President Obama's campaign. Wow, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people, one in 75. And I think that something that Republicans <coughs> and Democrats and anyone in politics um, uh, should always focus on, right, is this marketing funnel. It's the same funnel when you're selling a ShamWow as when you're selling something online. You want to bring people in through some kind of lead, a petition, a poll, a survey, bring them in, like we were talking about earlier with Move On. You want to get their email address, and then you want to fundraise. Mr. Cruz, Senator Cruz raised $3 million online during his Senate campaign, and it allowed us to compete in Texas, largely from small dollar donations and us doing this marketing funnel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Harris. Um, as we know, the use of uh, social media and online organizing is not exclusive to the United States. And uh, Dr. Yang, I'd like you to speak to us a little bit. Um, and perhaps answer some questions around uh, how online organizing has changed the landscape of social movements in China. Um, a great deal, um, just to be um, in just you know very brief terms. I often think about the differences between social media and activism in the United States and in China. One fundamental difference is that uh, in the U.S. there is a very mature civil society, you know flourishing of civic associations, NGOs, nonprofits, and so on. And these organizations provide a basis, very strong basis for online organizing. China has only an incipient civil society. There are also NGOs and actually a growing number of them. But they don't have resources, they don't have, many of them don't have full-time staff. And they also have to deal with uh, the state, the government, because government regulations have a lot of constraints for what kind of activities they may engage in, and so on and so forth. So because of this difference, I thought you know, chi in China, social media and internet really has helped to make up for a weak civil society so that citizens, both individuals and civic groups, can organize activities online in ways that cannot be done traditionally in offline situations. Another very important difference, fundamental difference, is, of course, the mass media landscape. Here we have a free and open and lively press. In China, 
the, the mass media is state controlled, state owned. So citizens do not have as much access to this kind of open channels for expression. And again, here, I would argue social media and internet make, really help to make up for the weakness of mass media. And therefore, individuals and, and, and you know, organized groups can use the internet to, uh, to express opinions, to you know, monitor the government, holding government officials accountable. Let me give you a couple of examples. You know, in, in, in recent years, there are a lot of so-called, a lot of so-called internet mass incidents. This is a kind of uh, Chinese official terminology for calling online protest activities, mass protest activi activities, often involving large numbers of people, individuals, very, you know, often not organized, online protesting about all kinds of things. But one particular issue that has been there you know, for years is uh, behavior of government officials and because there is a high degree of, de of distrust of government officials um, for, for lack of an institutional basis, a strong institutional sort of channels for holding government officials respon uh, you know, responsible, accountable. So citizens have often taken it upon themselves to, uh, to hold government officials accountable. How do they do this? In recent years, one of the examples, for instance, is a department a bureau head uh, in charge of uh, real estate in a major Chinese city. So in a number of public meetings, which are shown on television and then on, on videos, on, on in internet videos, he was uh, seen as wearing uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, very expensive uh, watches, different watches each time there seems to be a new one. And uh, you know, citizens, would, they would think, with a civil servant salary, you can't in any way afford this kind of expensive luxury watch. So they take it among themselves to, to search for information, and eventually they brought a case against that official, prosecuted him, charged him, and eventually the official was found guilty of graft. And this is only one of many examples. And I think in this case, is what, you know, the kind of investigative journalism which exists in China, but that's the kind of work that often investigative journalists do uh, is not enough, far from adequate, and therefore the internet and social media become these kind of channels for, <coughs> for monitoring government behavior, for articulate, <coughs> articulating citizen interests. There are also a lot of other cases where uh, we also know because of the rapid economic development, uh, you know, there, whole neighborhood will be taken down to build in huge high-rise buildings. And there is a lot of resistance uh, from the residents. And social media has been used as a way of putting up resistance. Middle class, middle class property owners have also been sort of using online forums to organize property owners, to organize to fight for their own kind of uh, you know, property because uh, they may before they buy a particular property, they may have been promised a piece of green right around the building, but then they found that it's not there. They were organized through BBS forums, still the kind of old fashioned, but nowadays through uh, iPhone, through WeChat, and the China's chat, chat room um, uh, app. And that's been very influential as well for informal organizing. I could go on and on, but I think these are a few examples. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Yang. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about how um, effective social media and online organizing can be for different interests and different causes. Um, but I think we're all also all very aware of the ways that uh, this, this type of communication can pose some dangers. Um, and Ms. Ellis, I'm hoping that you can address uh, the question of what legal risks um, that accompany online organizing. Uh, what are those risks? In, that attorneys should be aware of both for themselves and for their clients. When I, when I uh, speak on this subject, I tell people that I have the two rules of Jennifer. Um, and those rules are all laws and ethics rules that apply offline, apply online. So you use your common sense. And if you say, I can't do this offline, well, then I can't do it online. And the other thing, as I said, your ability to get in trouble is vastly improved by the size of the internet. 
So what I tend to say is, listen, if you're at a cocktail party and you say something really obnoxious about a judge, chances are it won't get back to the judge. And if it's a really good cocktail party, nobody's going to remember what you said anyway. But if you post it on the internet, people are going to share it. And it's going to go to above the law. Um, and it's going to go to all these other sites. And it's going to go further and further and further. That's what the, it's what the internet's about, right? It's going to go viral. And the judge is going to find out. And you have very client, kindly provided evidence of your insult. So the thing about social media, when it comes to the practice of law, when it comes to your clients using it, when it comes to you using it, is that there's this knee-jerk action we like, we forward, we respond, we speak by typing. And we don't think through what we're doing. We just do. The same problem exists with email sometimes. People are angry. How many of you have been mad and sent out an email that you oughtn't have sent out because you just didn't pause for a moment? What's much easier with this, or with this, or whatever you're using, to get yourself in a lot of trouble because you don't stop and think. And as lawyers, we have an ethical obligation not to bring disrepute to our profession. And, and frankly, if you do, even if it's not a clear ethical violation, it, it certainly can cause you trouble. Where I see problems for clients tends to involve them providing eviden evidence against themselves of a crime. Where I also see problems is people posting racist or otherwise inappropriate things. Uh, I'm brought to something that I mentioned to Siri uh, and to the rest of the panel via email the other day. A woman uh, posted some very negative tweets uh, racially. Uh, she was a teacher. Uh, this relates to Ferguson. And she was, was fired, or I think is at least on suspension. Teachers get in trouble a lot on social media because they're held to a certain standard. So the other problem is, is I think back to times when people have said, these people who we all should hate live at this address over here. And they got the address wrong. And so the people, these innocent people, are getting death threats on social media. Or even if they are not the innocent people, even if they did whatever horrible thing it is we as a society feel they should not have done, you're sharing their information. Well, what if somebody dies as a result of the information you share. Do we, in our efforts for social justice, have a right, never mind legally, but morally, to be threatening or causing threats to other people because we are sharing information at that level? So ethics risks, evidence risks, risk of causing harm to other people, and of course, reputational harm to yourself to your organization, to your client. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Khan, I'm, I'm wondering also in the push um, to use these online tools, if you could also speak to ways that that may alienate people, um, whether that's other attorneys who maybe don't have um, the, same, the same level of usage, um, clients that we may be trying to reach, um, or members of the community that our organization and organizational efforts are trying to help? Thanks. I think the problem is not just alienation, but just not, not reaching people at all. Um, technology does not replace boots on the ground, and trust cannot be built entirely online. So if, if I'm looking to try to make sure that we have people to testify in, in favor of a piece of legislation, or if we're looking for uh, plaintiffs for um, the Philly complaints case, I can't rely on a Facebook post or a tweet or even a mass email to find those people. Um, you know, we, our office called the 825 parents, guardians, students, and teachers who filed the complaints with the Department of Education. Those were personal interactions. That trust is necessary to build. Um, we also can't just throw up a web platform like Grounded in Philly and expect we're going to reach all of the people who need that information. 
if we do that, we're recreating the same inequitable structures that we're actually trying to dismantle. Um, I can't, you know, I can't expect folks in North Philly or in Kensington, uh, folks with language access issues, um, folks who, who actually don't have internet access, um, maybe they're, you know, a generation above the, um, the Tea Party grandmas that, that um, my co-panelist is talking about, that they're not getting the access to that information, and so they're actually not able to, um, to access the land, to get legal protections in the way that folks who have these tools uh, can get. Um, and I also want to, I spent a lot of time in civic hacking space recently. Um, it's not a place I ever thought I would be, but, and it's been really interesting uh, to engage with folks who really want to do social entrepreneurship and creating apps and platforms and, and hardware and, and software tools. But um, I see the patterns getting recreated um, that we really want to be disrupting. Um, and it's very, and it's analogous to me to, to academic researchers who say are looking at a community and looking at the impact of food insecurity or high stakes testing or environmental justice issues and going, going out and asking community members to answer these questions so that to develop this research um, and, and create c conclusions, but not asking those same communities to help them define the questions or to help them define you know, what that information is going to be used for. So creating an app or a tool or a platform without asking the people that you want to serve is, is really recreating um, a system of inequity, inequity and getting at your point, alienating people. Thank you, Ms. Khan. Uh, another concern that we may have um, is with the use of big data or the ability to um, surveil and watch um, online activities um, at a very different level. Um, Dr. Yang, do we, um, how do we see governments using the exposure that's inherent in the use of social media and online activism, um, potentially against activists? Well, the traffic goes both ways. So I've just said, for instance, in China, for China's uh, activists online and offline, social media really provide a very important uh, new way of monitoring government uh, officials, uh, you know, holding officials accountable. Re you know, that depends on new kinds of information, new forms of communication that were unavailable to them in earlier times. But the other side of the story is that, you know, government always has an interest in monitoring the activities of the citizens. And nowadays, government also has new sources of uh, monitoring the behavior of citizens, new ways of, uh, new forms of surveillance. Um, so much so, actually, in the uh, field of social movement study, some scholars have argued that there has been a shift, a major shift in, the, in, in government behavior toward activism, social movement, in the sense that in earlier times, think about the 60s and 70s, government was more likely to use force, kind of coercive behavior, more and more, you know, since the 1990s, you know, in recent years, the Occupy, there is an emphasis on collecting information, intelligence-based, proactive kind of government, of, of, of government behavior. Government wants to channel particular kinds of activities toward you know, limited spaces so that citizens can be monitored more closely, and of course, New files, uh, we don't know exactly, this will be an important question, but very difficult for research. We don't ex know exactly a lot of the ways that the government actually uh, collects this information and makes use of this information. I think there's very little work about this, uh, except that we know that that is being done from recent cases like NSA and you know, Snowden. Um, I think I'll, I'll defer certainly to a to our legal scholars and professionals in this aspect. But I, I would say for activists and citizens uh, nowadays in the age of information, you can never be too careful about the kind of information uh, that you release about yourself, about your organizations. So informa information kind of uh, uh, privacy awareness of the, of the importance of this kind of uh, potential of being used by government uh, against you. I think that's really becoming much more important than before. Thank you. Um, we've touched on this a couple times, and you guys have all spoken to this a little bit, um, but the ability to kind of um, say and do anything 
online in terms of the initial um, statement that's made. Uh, Mr. Harris, if anybody can say anything online um, and there's little filter for whether or not that is completely accurate and fact-based, fact how um, do we, in promoting our own interests and organizations, um, increase the authenticity and reliability of our messages online? So great question. Two points here to start with. There was a recent study done in England where people admitted that they trusted Wikipedia more than encyclopedia. The second thing is that um, there was a bipartisan study done after the 2012 elections by a Republican and Democratic polling firm which showed that people trusted information that they received online more than any other place about politics. So that screen one, where are people going to find the truth? They're going to screen two, right? When you see a negative ad about someone you like and you want to have some facts behind it, don't you type it into Google? And what's scary about that is people like me are running search ads and 41% of people in a, in a recent study don't know the difference in a paid search ad and an organic search result. So I would be taking you off onto some website that I would want you to see what my clients wanted you to see and what their facts and, and, and truth were. So I think online it's very ambiguous what the truth is. And I think the scary thing is that the internet has brought about this this, as a, this uh, professor at the University of Texas, Talia Stroud, wrote this book called Niche News, Personalized News, right? You're receiving information and the truth that you want to see. And I think that that's kind of scary because with the internet, there is almost no truth anymore. You can go and fact check anything you want, right? Is Obamacare working or is it not? Is the Second Amendment helping to you know, protect people or is it not? There are some things that have facts and, the, and with the internet, you can find facts to defend whatever your position is. I want to say when it comes to authenticity, that Facebook actually, a lot of people aren't, aren't aware, but Facebook has a, this unofficial term that governs Facebook called their EdRink system. And how the EdRink system works is, there is, it's not a coincidence when I go on my Facebook that I'm seeing uh, content from my wife and my best friends and my family. It's because I've interacted with their content the most. So, uh, for example, if you go on Facebook and see a post that we just posted for Senator Cruz on this, on this amnesty thing, on, on President Obama's immigration law, um, we posted a, a graphic. And the point of that graphic, it's called a this person graphic, is to get people to share it. Because if people are not engaging with this law school, with this university, with whatever organization that you're with, if they're not engaging on your Facebook page, then they're not seeing your content. So you have to be engaging. You have to encourage shares. You have to encourage likes. You have to encourage comments. And you need to be authentic. So one thing that I try to encourage my clients to do is to hold online town halls a lot and to engage. And this was mentioned earlier, y'all, but social media is a two-way street. And so many people in every organization, they just post outward. And they don't think about the real voters and the real activists and the real people and law school students who are engaging in the comments, who are sending emails, who are talking through the website, who are engaging on the, the you know, Phil Ed hashtag. These are real people that you need to seek out and you need to find and engage with. And, and by engaging, you're gonna, you are going to get that authenticity that you want to bring people into your community and then bring them into your ShamWow funnel. Thank you so much, Mr. Harris. Um, I think another concern that many of us have become aware of and even popularized by the term slacktivism um, is that clicking um, potentially that you like something or retweeting it um, maybe isn't the type of activism that a social movement needs. And Mr. Weiner, I'm hoping that you can address um, concerns around the attention span uh, deficit uh, online and if we should be concerned with slacktivism in that sense that people maybe are just clicking and then not actually engaging. I'm sorry, I was tweeting. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> so online organizing sometimes asks people to take action from home. This is true. So there are actually a lot of, a lot of useful tactics that you can easily do from home. You can sign petitions that can be printed and delivered to decision makers maybe at a big press conference, to demonstrate how many people actually care about an issue. So that's something you could do from home. You could send an email. You could make a phone call to a decision maker. 
like your member of Congress or the CEO of a corporation to put pressure on them to act. You could donate money to hire organizers, to buy ads that influence the debate. You could call voters, maybe in your neighborhood, maybe in another state, to make sure that they vote. And you can also mobilize your friends to do any of those same things by posting on Facebook or tweeting. So these are actually all real ways to build power and make change. And there's nothing wrong with them just because you can do them at home. And at the same time, you wouldn't want to limit yourself only to tactics that you can do from home. So um, we talk about online to offline organizing, which means using email or social media to ask someone to take action outside their home. Maybe it's a candlelight vigil to call attention to police violence in our communities. Maybe it's a meeting with a member of Congress or a march to put pressure on a politician who's doing the wrong thing. Maybe it's an act of civil disobedience to stop a dangerous pipeline. If you're an organizer and you see that someone's taken a couple actions at home, you know that they're pretty committed to the issue and you can invite them to take on greater leadership in the organizing. Organizers call this the ladder of engagement. And online organizing is actually a, a powerful tool for allowing organizers to identify the potential leaders to really invest time in building relationship with. So in other words, we can find each other online, we do what we can do from home, then we take it to the streets. And it's really in person that we build those stronger relationships, that we build our analysis of what's wrong in the world. And also we give each other hope. We inspire each other to increase our commitment to doing absolutely everything we can to change the world, to prioritize those acts over the kind of daily distractions, daily things that, that are required for upkeep of, of one's life. Really, I think of it as at home, we're alone. And in person, we have company. And we, can, we, can, um, we, we come to belief. We, we feel, si se puede, yes, we can. It's actually um, a, those beliefs and those relationships that are what keep our attention focused on what matters most. Thank you, Mr. Weiner. Um, I think we've learned um, quite a bit about the ways in which we um, use social media today. And I'd like um, Ms. Ellis, if you could speak to us about how <coughs> attorneys especially um, could use social media to further advocate for their clients or organizations um, using some of the skills perhaps that we've talked about today. I'm gonna be pragmatic for a moment. We're brands, folks. I believe you said this, Mr. Harris, that social activism, efforts, politics, is no different from selling widgets. We're selling something that we want people to buy, whether we want them to pay money for it, to pay time for it, to give us their vote. Whatever it is, we're selling something. Social media is a fabulous way to reach people. And so you use it for that purpose. Google AdWords, Facebook ads, Twitter ads, are wonderful ways to reach people. And in most jurisdictions, perfectly ethical to use. You have to check your jurisdiction. As I've already said, though, you must act within the confines of the ethics rules. One area where we need to be very careful is if you are in the midst of litigation, for example, representing a client, and you step outside the courthouse door and you decide, I'm going to share the complaint on Twitter. You've just taken that complaint here in Pennsylvania and in many other states outside the legal protection against defamation. So if you share that complaint on Twitter or Facebook, guess what you just opened yourself up to? A lawsuit for defamation. If you hand that complaint to a reporter, guess what you just opened yourself up to? A lawsuit. Don't know, you have to know what you can do and what you can't do. As officers of the court, we have these ethical obligations, but you also know, need to know where you can get in legal trouble. However, as long as you know those things, just as we can use the press to help our clients, we can use social media to help our clients. <coughs> if you have a client that people believe is wrongly accused, 
you can use social media to get support for that client. And let's be realistic, to affect the jury pool. Mm -hmm. And to get financial support. Many, many cases where people do a GoFundMe campaign and can get money to ha fund a very, very expensive trial. Because even if you're willing to do the work pro bono, there's still experts and there's still all this other stuff you have to fund. So it's really a two-part thing. Make sure you know and appreciate what you can and cannot do. But then go ahead and do what's okay. To reach the community, to ask the community to speak up for your client and to bring awareness to his or her situation or to his or her event, for example, as you've been discussing about yours. You know, there's all sorts of ways. In Philadelphia, the, um, since I live in the area, I am well aware of what's been going on in school districts. And social media, I think, has enabled those issues to go much further than they would have gone 10 years ago and to play a huge role in our recent election in, for the first time in many, many years, a governor being a one-term governor. That does not happen in Pennsylvania. We flip parties every eight years, not this year. And I think social media played a huge, huge role in that. And with compliments to Mr. Harris, a huge, huge role in the success of his candidates as well. You can reach out in amazing ways using social media. Just make sure you know what you can and cannot do. Please. Thank you. Um, we've mentioned today that Online organizing doesn't replace real organizing and real activism, but I think there's still a lot of excitement about the ways that we can continue to expand upon and utilize uh, social media and online organizing. And um, Ms. Khan, I'd like you to start, um, and then followed by Mr. Weiner and Mr. Harris, about what you're most excited about um, in terms of the new frontiers coming forward in online organizing. Sure. Um, full disclosure, I'm not on the cutting edge here, but I'll give you my thoughts. Um, I've, I want to suggest first that, that we're not always sell, selling something, but that we're building and sharing. And that it really is, and, or at least it can be about the collective that Dr. Yang was talking about. Um, and what I'm excited about um, is not necessarily the new, but the who. It's about who's engaging to build these spaces. Um, I'm very excited about um, Girl Develop It in Philadelphia that they're working with young women to, to learn how to code um, and build new spaces, um, to build new tools. Um, I'm excited about a group of uh, queer people of color who are building a social media platform that's really like coming out of their brilliance, um, but they're also their assessment of what the needs are and what the possibilities are. Um, I'm also excited about open data as a way of um, increasing transparency um, and a way of sharing information with communities so that they can they can look at that data and interpret it themselves and create their own stories. But I also think that there, we always have to caution that open data is not open government. And so open data is not also not open records. And so that we have a lot of vigilance we still have to do around government transparency and that releasing data sets um, and releasing controlled data sets is not enough. Um, I also would just want to think about the networking that's possible and the fact that, you know, I'm here today in this room, but I'm also in Dallas at the Facing Race Conference, and I'm also in Ferguson waiting for the possible grand jury indictment, and the fact that I'm connecting with activists in all of these spaces, and to think about, you know, the classic, what's become the classic hashtag as a way of convening us. I talked about um, PHL Ed. I mean, there are just so many examples of using that, that as a way of framing the conversation and bringing people together, but also subverting the, the conversation, so CEG hashtag black Twitter, um, which has really been an amazing way of, of reframing and, and um, offering a critique around racial justice. Um, it's very simple and it's very, very interesting to me. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Weiner, if you would also tell us what you're excited about. Yeah, I'm gonna say something similar, which is that at the beginning, um, online organizing was really the kind of exclusive domain of uh, what were called net roots groups. So these are groups that were born online. Um, so move on is an example of that. And these groups were often founded by techies like me, kids who grew up um, using computers and being computer nerds. And 
um, increasingly online organizing, as Amy Laura just said, is part of the um, toolkit for organizers of all kinds. And people are using online tools um, strategically. So they're using them when they're best suited for, for the moment and for the strategy that they're pursuing. So online organizing, for instance, it's a, it's a great tool for rapid response to breaking news. It's a great tool for casting a wide net to reach all the people who care about an issue. And at, at the same time, those people are using offline tools, traditional organizing tools, when those are more useful. Um, so for building deep one-on-one -on -one relationships, for escalating pressure on a decision maker by showing up outside their office, so that kind of strategic thinking, as I said before, th that's really at the core of, of any kind of organizing. And so it's exciting to me to see um, people learning how to use this, this tool set um, as, as one, one tool among many in a toolkit. Um, it's, a, it's a tactic that, that we can consider um, as part of a broader strategy rather than treating it as a sort of um, a strategy in and of itself. And the other thing I'm excited about <laughs> is that more and more people are understanding that the internet is a vital space for democratic participation. And if that's true, then we need to guarantee universal access. We need to defend the open internet from both corporate and government interference, as we've talked about a little bit on this panel. And in particular, I'm inspired by the growth of the movement for uh, digital rights against digital surveillance. Uh, in other words, the movements for net neutrality, for the FCC to treat the internet as a communication medium, and for the movements against the NSA spying on Americans. Hashtag Citizen Four. What was that? I said hashtag Citizen Four. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Harris. Yeah, so um, I'm excited because every day uh, there's something new online. And I'm excited because the type of digital campaign we ran on Mike Huckabee's presidential race where I was updating his MySpace page is drastically different than the centralized nation builder database and, and individual type of communication that we were able to do on Senator McConnell's campaign. I'm excited but scared that when I visited my, my grandma a few weeks ago, my 14-year-old cousin told me Facebook is for losers now. <laughs> and now I, I have an Elo account. Does anyone else have an Elo account? It's the new Facebook you're on? Elo, okay. So um, for those who don't know, check it out, E-L-L-O dot co, Elo. Um, so I'm excited because of this. I'm excited because this is allowing people individually to run their own campaigns. And give credit to President Obama again in his operation, their iPhone app that they had during the 2012 race was phenomenal. They essentially opened up their database and allowed anyone to download their iPhone app and see on a Google map of who their neighbors were that were persuadable. They gave them a script and instantly that information went back into their database. Oh, that's great. That's great and that's not happening on a large scale in almost any other race. And certainly it wasn't happening for Governor Romney. I'm excited about things being crowdsourced. I'm excited that on Senator Cruz's campaign, we asked people on Facebook what bumper sticker we should use, and we gave them six different options. I'm excited about that and the uses of crowdsourcing on campaign and in grassroots technology. And I'm excited about technology and data saving money. Let me tell you a story. My, my biggest client last cycle was Linda McMahon, who, well, not 14, but 12, she ran for Senate in Connecticut. This was the second time. She spent $50 million of her own money. I believe about $28 million of that went in the New York media market. To reach Connecticut, you have to buy on New York television, right? Uh, about half of Connecticut voters live in Fairfield County, which is in the New York media market, and she needed to reach those voters. Only one of $10 went into Connecticut that she spent $28 million on. Just think of the waste of television advertising like that, right? What a waste, $25 million pissed, excuse my French, down the toilet, okay? And only $2.8 million that were able to go, but you had to do it. So what I'm excited about is targeting, being able to target people individually. What's scary about that? A little bit, though, people are going to get these niche messages. People are going to, we're going to go and find out what, you know, where you stand before you know it, and we're going to start to target you. And that's going on now on campaigns, and, but I'm, I'm excited about it, and 
I'm also a little bit scared about it. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that um, phrases it pretty well for many of us. We're really excited, but maybe we're a little scared as well. Um, at this time, I would like to open it up to questions um, from the audience. And if you could just grab the note cards at the center of your table, and our um, and Jacob and Adika will come and grab those. If you already have questions, um, please please submit them that way, um, and we'll get those answered by our panelists. I have one to start here. Um, that's going back, uh, Dr. Yang, to your um, discussion of um, governments using um, online engagement to then also keep tabs on their citizens. Um, and if there are uh, human rights organizations that you're aware of um, that are addressing some of those issues, whether it's here in the United States or uh, internationally. Um, yes, um, actually there is a project going on, started here at Penn, at Annenberg School, but now mainly based at the, I think, uh, in the think tank in Washington, D.C. It's called Digital Ranking Project, D Digital, Rights, uh, Digital Rights Ranking Project, and the goal of that project, this is mainly to target corporations, to rank uh, major corporations in terms of how they respect the rights of, you know, citizens' rights to privacy and so on. That's a way of holding accountable the major players in this field who have access to, you know, big data about the individual citizens. There are, of course, also a number of human rights organi organizations around the world. Uh, uh, working very uh, conscientiously for, for years about uh, citizens' privacy and rights. Um, there, is, um, there is a publication, I think it's uh, about censorship, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> which has been documenting activities of government censorship, uh, harassment of dissidents and human rights activists around the world, including China. And then there are some um, uh, scholarly research basically trying to document uh, periodically you know, every other year or so to see, for instance, how the Chinese government's uh, um, technologies of surveillance may be changing, strategies of surveillance may be changing. There, there, there's uh, a lot of effort um, in this aspect, but uh, I think uh, we need more coordinated, concerted effort in order to really make an impact. Because there's still a lot of things that government do that we have no idea about. Thank you. A second question here um, addresses measuring um, the success of um, online activism. And uh, Mr. Weiner and Mr. Harris, uh, maybe you can each speak uh, each briefly about how um, the organizations that you work with measure that success of your online engagement. Yeah, I, I, I think of um, two, two axes, breadth and depth. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we spoke before of the, 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 the power of some tools like an online petition to, to gather a, a, a large group of people together. So there's definitely one, one kind of metric of success is if, if you launch a petition and a lot of people sign it, more people than you expected to sign it, you have indication that there's broad interest. And, and that that's a place to, to dig down to do more organizing. It's a, it's a way that people are voting with their feet and showing that they're, that they're passionate about that and that that's something that more organizing resources should, should follow. And at the same time, I would measure in terms of depth um, and I would ask, you know, I spoke before about the ladder of engagement, the ways that people engage in, in, in more and more, um, way, ways that take on more and more leadership. And so I would, would, would wanna know, did this campaign engage people who um, before all they had done is sign an online petition and this time they made a phone call? Did it engage the people who, made, who called their member of Congress last time, but this time they actually organized a, a house party or attended, att attended a, a, a rally? So breadth and depth would be um, my two measures because really we're talking about um, where, where, is there, um, where is there juice for organizing? Where do people have energy and passion that is, is not yet organized? where that power has not yet been, been brought to, to bear on an issue? So I'd say a few things. One is that um, 
something I'm excited about that kind of leans into this. So I helped Senator Cornyn, who's our other senator from Texas, uh, uh, down, I downloaded his, the Twitter app on his phone. And every day he wakes up and he engages on Twitter. And I would say that a success of our initiatives, and here in Pennsylvania, I'll be working with Senator Toomey's campaign, actually, um, here. And I think you're going to see, and, and I don't know him well, but a, a lot of people in Congress, they are using technology themselves. And I think a measure of success would be generating, I know certainly from my client's perspective, Twitter, uh, and, and tweets from constituents and people that have problems, whether it's an education problem or whatever the issue is, directly to them. Senator Cornyn reads them. Senator Cornyn reads them. Senator Cruz reads them themselves. And it's, you know, it's, it's exciting and it's also something that um, from an activist grassroots perspective, I think that, that, that should be mentioned and discussed. Two is, Obviously, it depends on what your goals are. If your goals are fundraising, it's very different, right? If the goals for Senator Cruz are to fundraise on, you know, amnesty or whatever, versus for Senator McConnell to reach coal voters and to build a, a, a grassroots coalition online, it's going to be very, very different. But when it comes to something that, that um, we did about six months ago, one of my clients was trying to generate calls on Obamacare to Congress, to different members. And what we did was we split tested over email, website, ads on everywhere you can imagine, Drudge Report, Fox News, everywhere that you know my people are, um, and Twitter. And we, um, what we found without a doubt was the, the, the largest amount of calls to these members came from Facebook new, newsfeed, Facebook mobile newsfeed. That is right now where you're gonna get your most success is Facebook mobile. And everything that you do on Facebook should be, should be aimed at that. Also, uh, for Senator McConnell's campaign, we wanted to reward people who were activists, who took action online. And we talk about this term slacktivist, which is a great term and it's very true. But we didn't want slacktivists. We wanted to help encourage people who are activists. So what we did was we went out to Silicon Valley and we found a company called PunchTab. They were doing a, uh, essentially uh, online, they have an online reward system that they worked with Arby's on. If you go to Arby's website and you say you like Arby's and you go there and you tweet that Arby's is so great, you get all these points. And I thought that's an interesting idea. So we took that to the McConnell campaign. We're giving rewards to people who tweeted about Senator McConnell. And if you have a lot of followers on Twitter and your friends clicked on that link, guess what? You got more points. And you could take those points back to our store and you could go to a baseball game with Senator McConnell. Exciting. You all want to do that, right? So, <laughs> sorry, someone already won, okay? So don't, don't be getting at your phones right now. Um, so that was a really interesting for us, and people did it. Thousands of people did it, right? You could reward for a bumper sticker. You could reward for a T-shirt. So I would say that that was a good measure of success. And we use ads to constantly bring people back to that, to that platform and keep re-engaging them. And then we knew their actions. Y'all, as soon as you came to our website, you got points. We knew if you had been there before, right? We knew if you shared our content. And that, that, kind, of activism, that kind of activism is very exciting, and, and there is the ability to attract all of that. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Ms. Khan, this next question is for you specifically regarding the Grounded in Philly website. Um, uh, one of our attendees has said that she visited or um, that they went to your website um, and noticed that a lot in the neighborhood um, that's labeled as public is actually being used. Um, and has, is wondering if the accessibility of information about ownership of these lots could have negative impacts on the communities, for instance, people who are working towards adverse possession. Sure, I think that there's absolutely um, an, that opportunity. Well, I, I think two things. One is um, that lots that may be listed as publicly owned um, and vacant or privately owned and vacant may not, be, may not actually be vacant um, for a number of reasons. One is because our public data is behind reality. Um, and so that's one thing that we're trying to figure out how to expose and we actually crowdsource that information. Um, so people tell us there's a house on this lot, I'm using this lot, it's actually my side yard, um, so that we can share that information and, and update it. Um, in terms of making the information accessible and whether that um, 
that can hurt a, uh, an effort to gain a lot safe by adverse possession, which requires you to be on that lot for 21 years, which is a long time, but many folks are actually pretty far along. It's the same information that's publicly available everywhere. Um, so if you're a developer, you have that access to information, you know where to find it, you have different pathways. And so we made a choice. We said, okay, well, we can make this information accessible to people who want it and need it and who don't have that same access as a real estate developer or someone in government or someone in academia. Um, or we could keep it hidden in our office and share it with whoever calls us. And so it was a choice we made and it's a choice we continue to think about. We're holding data about hundreds of gardens throughout the city of Philadelphia um, and the city of Philadelphia has asked us for that list. Um, and they've said, well, we want to preserve those spaces. And we said, great. And let's figure out how we physically contact all of those hundreds of people to be able to say, okay, the city of Philadelphia actually wants to either um, get access to the privately owned tax delinquent lot and make it available to you or make available to you um, that publicly owned lot that, that has been vacant. So we're, we're grappling with those questions. They're not easy answers. Thank you so much. Um, I've been receiving a lot of questions about privacy and information collection. Um, and perhaps um, both Ms. Ellis and um, Mr. Weiner can address some of the concerns um, with getting information from people online, um, whether that's, Ms. Ellis, perhaps an ethical concern about using that information, um, and then Mr. Weiner, perhaps, um, how people use that information um, in an effective way, the information that's gathered um, through these sources. One of the most common things, one of the most common complaints I see on Facebook and Twitter and, and, and the web in general is, hey, what about my right to privacy? What about my right to first speech, freedom of speech? What about this? What about that? And if I feel like it, and I don't mind the headache, I remind them that these are private organizations and they have no right of privacy, they have no free speech, they have none of these things. You know, most people don't read the terms of service of any of these sites. If you don't read the terms of service, and I don't blame you, they're very, very long, don't be surprised when you have no privacy. You know, and even if you use the privacy controls, the reality is people can share things. To, you know, your friend decides to share it. You don't know who friends of friends are. You don't understand the privacy rules, whatever. If, as a lawyer, you are following the terms of service of your own site, if you have one, um, if you're using the data in a way that does not violate any law or any confidentiality concern, meaning your communications with your own clients sort of a thing, then it's free game. There's nothing illegal about using this data. The amount of data, and Mr. Harris could probably speak to this even better than I, is staggering. <laughs> the way things follow us around on the web these days is staggering. You know, this thing knows where I am all the time. I've chosen, as have most Americans, to give up my privacy for the sake of convenience. That's what we've done. And we've done it with nary a complaint. Every so often we complain to Facebook and Facebook goes, oh, I'm sorry. And then a few months later, what does it do? It calls it something different and implements it anyway. That's how it works, folks. We have no privacy. Isn't that the famous quote? Get over it. Mr. Weiner. Yeah. Um, so I think there, there, there are two, at least two framings here. So there's a, there's a framing about privacy that I think um, for, for me, there, there's, a, there's a set of people whose life experience has led them to expect to have privacy. Um, and this, this feels like a, a new violation of, of that expectation. Um, there are also many communities, uh, communities of color and low income communities, communities that um, have been challenging um, the policies of, of governments who, who have not had that expectation for, for really ever, um, who, are, who are used to surveillance, um, who, um, who, who know that, the, that, their, that their life is actually being sur surveyed by the government um, for the purpose of, of disorganizing, for the purpose of disrupting um, their, their free political expression. Um, so I think 
those those two framings, right? We we, we exist in a, in a in a moment where those two framings um, are are barricaded from each other, are segregated from each other by the segregation in our society. And I think one of one of the interesting um, things that's happening right now is the is 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 the learning from communities that have long experienced surveillance um, by by those of us such as myself who who have had expectations of privacy. Um, so, I, I, and, and I, I would say, um, I, I don't think, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think that we should expect to give up our privacy um, for the sake of convenience. I think that um, there, there may be some, um, you know, there may be frameworks and and policies and cultural expectations that we haven't created yet. Um, but I think that we get to decide that, and um, we get to expect. Our, um, our our government and our um, and and the and the corporations that we that we do business with to to, to respect those those expectations. So um, I'm not ready to not ready to give up yet on on us having our rights. In particular, because of what I said before about the ways in which the, these spaces that that where surveillance is occurring are are some of the strongest spaces we have for um, for political expression. So I think. If we if we if we give them up um, to to be to surveillance, then we've lost a significant possibility of um, of, of people having real power in the world. Do you think I could say one quick thing on that? Yes. Um, so first thing is, I think this is a, an issue that crosses partisan lines. I have a shirt that says Team Edward on it that I proudly wear out because I like Edward Snowden, and so does my wife, and I think a lot of conservatives do. Um, so, you know, no one, I think a lot of people, when I say no one, a lot of people have problems with the government uh, looking at, at everything that you're doing and taking your information. So I think that this is certainly an issue that crosses partisan lines. Second is I think Facebook is one of the biggest culprits of this. And Facebook, I've met with their back-end data company out in San Francisco. The name of the company is Data Logics. And Data Logics essentially takes all of your information and uh, helps Facebook sell it, right? And why, how, why is Facebook worth billions and billions of dollars? It's not because we go in there and post pretty photos of cats. It's because of the data, right? That's exactly what it is. And they're selling it and they're making a freak ton of money off of all, everything that we've given them from the beginning. From the beginning of time when I set up Facebook at 18 or whatever I was, they have all of my information, everything that I post, everything that I'm talking about. Right, so this is why this new Elo thing came about, and it's not going to catch on, but because Facebook now is just selling you ads on exactly what you want to to a C. But what people don't understand that was mentioned here that was so great, when you sign up for Men's Health online, or you buy a magazine online, you are opting in to sell all of your information to everyone that I can buy. And I do buy it for my campaigns and candidates. Right, so, you know, sorry to say, but we are at fault here. We can't have everything that we want to bet, get Mintel subscriptions and be on Facebook and whatever. We are giving them this information. We're opting in. When you click that Facebook connect button or log in with Facebook, that little blue button looks so sweet. That, that blue button is the end to your privacy. Okay? So as soon as you click that, you are giving the advertiser and the big data companies every single piece of data that you have ever put in Facebook to be re-advertised and sold on and on down the line. Yep, absolutely. And they're connecting it offline. Data logics, <laughs> this was a huge, big piece of controversy and everybody forgot about it. But data logics connects those little cards you use when you go shopping. Oh, yeah. You know those? Yeah. They connect that with your Facebook stuff. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Unfortunately, we are out of time, and I know this is a really <laughs> exciting um, issue, and I have a lot of great questions here that we did not have the chance to get to. Um, so please um, do rely on the expertise of these great panelists and um, join me in thanking them for their expertise and time today.